Okay, let's talk about hypothesis testing. Uh, and this is really going to be able to explain what an alternative and a null hypothesis are and how we can utilize our statistics to figure out whether we like the sample that we have. Is a sample the same as our population or not? So the first thing that we have to understand is really the difference between a one-tailed and a two-tailed test. So a one-tailed test is directional. And then we can have a one sample or a two sample test. So a one sample test is we just have a set of data and we're trying to look to see if it matches uh, a specific value. So in that case, we would have an all, all, our null hypothesis, sorry, my words are getting a little bit messed up, where we're going to say the mean of our sample would be equal to 72. And our alternative hypothesis would say, well, we actually believe that the mean is greater than 72. Now, if we had two samples and we want to compare two samples together, our null hypothesis would be that mu1 minus mu2 would be equal to zero. And then our alternative hypothesis would be that mu1 minus mu2, let's say it could be less we believe it's less than 72. So somehow we've done a manipulation and we expect the manipulation to change the way our data looks by 72, whether it's increasing or decreasing. Two-tailed test is just non-directional. And when we say non-directional, We'll say that mu is equal to 72, you know, using the one sample case from above. Or our alternative hypothesis is that it's just simply not equal to 72. And then for the two sample case, mu1 minus mu2 is equal to 0. And mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to 0. So you see a theme with each one of these null hypotheses. Uh, the null hypothesis either is related for a one sample test to a very specific number, or for a two sample test, setting everything equal to zero. All right, so the specific prediction using a one-tailed test essentially means we need to have a smaller test, test statistic in order to have a significant result. problem that we have, right, because you have a one-tailed test, it's directional, you're either greater than or less than. All right, so if we predict it and if in the end it's actually in the wrong direction, we're going to miss detecting an effect that actually does exist. Right, so if we say that it's greater than and the value is actually less than, we've missed that effect. So we've predicted it to be the wrong direction. So unless you have prior research that specifically says it should be greater than or less than, we should really just use a two-tailed test. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about, like we see this little graph below. I'm going to take that and I'm going to expand upon that just a little bit. So this is essentially the z-score, right? And the center of that is our mean. 
And we're going to have, I'm going to look at a two-tailed test here where we're looking at a number. So if you look at a Z table, you'll find that for a Z of 95%, we have to have half of that. So Z of alpha over 2 would be 1.645. So that would be the value here, 1.645, and this would be negative 1.645. So if we end up with a value of our test, test statistic in either one of these two highlighted areas, we have to reject our null hypothesis. Right? And so this value from here to here is our alpha over 2, and from here to here is alpha over 2. So if our alpha is 95%, that alpha over 2 is 0 0.025, or 2.5% on either side. If the test statistic that we have falls in the middle, we don't reject the null hypothesis. So that's how everything kind of falls in there, is anything that falls in this area, this is called our rejection region. Right here, because it's a two-tailed test, we have two rejection regions. Anything that falls in there, our test statistic, we're going to have to reject our null hypothesis. Now what does this look like if we're looking at a one-tailed test? So if it's greater than, we're going to use this side over here. And again, if we're looking at a level of confidence of 95%, now all 95 is at this level, so alpha is 0 0.05. So now this is 1.96. And anything that's here, we go ahead and reject our null. And anything that falls on the other side, we do not reject our null hypothesis. So there's the difference between a one-tailed and a two-tailed test. Um, and hopefully that will help you as you go through. I like using a lot of diagrams. Uh, when you do your hypothesis testing, if this is somewhat new to you, draw the diagram, draw your test statistic or your critical value. Uh, sometimes these are called the critical values. And when you calculate through your test statistic, you'll have a calculated value. Find out where that calculated value falls. If it falls in the middle region, you don't have to reject your null hypothesis. All right, so let's talk about the type 1 and the type 2 error. So the type 1 error is associated with alpha, and alpha is usually 0 0.05, representing 95% level of confidence. Um, so type 1 error says there is a genuine effect in the population, but there's really not. And that's why it's an error. So the bad thing with the type 1 error is we can actually reject a true null hypothesis. Type 2, on the other hand, we believe there is no effect when in actuality there is. Now for type 2, that usually is associated with the beta level or power. And 1 minus beta tells us what our power is. And usually it's um, two or four times alpha. Uh, so two times 0 0.05 or two times 5% would be a 10%. Um, I usually like to use four times alpha. So four times our 0 0.05 gives us uh, 0 0.2, which is why it says we're often 0 0.2, because that is four times alpha. So... If our, our beta value is 0 0.2, means our power is equal to 80%. So the problem with the type 2 error is that we do not reject a false null hypothesis. Now, I think that's a little bit confusing, so I'm going to create hopefully less confusion by drawing you a little table. So we have a true state, um, 
let's look at an, an example of, we're going to talk like about the EPA. And the EPA is going to look at a company. So they're not in violation, or they are in violation, right? Of EPA standards. All right, or we'll go over here. And we'll call this the decision level. So the company is in violation or the company is not in violation. Oops. All right, so we're saying that, you know, we want to test whether or not the um, company is violating EPA standards. So we want to say, uh, we're going to say a null hypothesis, say the null hypothesis that if they are equal to three, they're not in violation. And the alternative hypothesis is that if it is greater than three, they are in violation. So the company not in violation would mean that null hypothesis is true. And the decision that they actually do, the company is in violation, they're going to reject H not or the null hypothesis company not in violation, no hypothesis is true. Okay, so if the company is not in violation, but you find that the company is in violation, that's where the type 1 error comes in. Obviously, if it's in violation and the decision is in violation, that is correct, as is this section down here. And then if the company is in violation, but our decision is that they are not in violation, that's where we get the type 2 error. Hopefully that helped clears it up just a little bit. All right, now we talk about an effect size. Effect size is just a way to figure out a standard way to compare different tests that we run. So standardized, right, it's comparable. Uh, the good news with an effect size is it's not nearly as reliant on the sample size. And we use a effect size to objectively evaluate the hypothesis. So when I talk about effect size, I like to just say, is it practically significant or not? So one of the things that, um, a good example, is we find out that we're doing a test on <clears throat> speeds along roadways. And we find the mean speed of one roadway uh, to be 54 miles an hour. 
and we find the mean speed on the second roadway to be 55 miles per hour. Now, if we have a very large sample size, we can say that we have a statistically significant difference, which means we have to reject the null. And again, without even stating what the null was, we know that the null hypothesis is that mu1 minus mu2 is zero. So we have actually found out that mu1, and you can kind of convert that to mu1 is equal to mu2, if that makes your life a little bit simpler. So we have just found out that mu1 does not equal mu2. So let's ask the question. In your speedometer, in your vehicle, can you differentiate, okay, let's assume you don't have a digital speedometer, can you differentiate between 55 and 54 miles per hour? Let me ask a second question. Is your speedometer properly calibrated as compared to the person that's driving next to you? Is that properly calibrated? Could there be a difference in calibration alone? Now let's ask about the instrument in which we got this data. Was that calibrated between the two times that we collected that data? So while this may be statistically different, what our effect size is going to tell us We don't need to worry about it. It may be statistically different, different, but it's practically the same. Which means if you're telling your client to do something, they're going, you're going to invest a million dollars based upon this output. And because it's statistically significant, you would have your client spend a million dollars. And after the fact, somebody else is going to come back and collect the same data, and they're going to find that it was not statistically significant, and what they just implemented, that million dollars, was useless. That's why you've got this practical, this effect size on the other side to say, I understand it's statistically different, but practically we have no difference, which means you still should not implement the million dollars of spending. All right, so what is an effect size? We have a ton of different ways that we can look at effect. Um, we're going to talk about correlation in a minute. So Pearson's R is pretty good. It's pretty intuitive. Unless sample sizes are different. So, in general, you'll probably use the Pearson's, but sometimes you might have to go ahead and use Cohen's D. So if you have an R of 0.1 or Cohen's D of 0.2, we look at this and we can say... The effect explains a whopping 1% of the total variance. How did I get 1%? 0.1 squared is equal to 0 0.01. So all we need to do is square the value of R and find out what variance is associated with that effect. So that's nothing. So very, very small effect. All right, the next one. The effect explains 9% of the total variance. Medium effect, 0.5 or greater. The effect explains 25% of the variability. But these are canned effect sizes. You really have to figure out what effect size do you have and how is it going to relate to your research context. So it's not just something that you can say, well, this is what we're going to do. Uh, make sure it relates to your research, research context.
uh, before you do too much. Last thing I want to talk about is sample size. So your sample size is generally equal to your variance, Z beta minus Z alpha over 2 squared over your effect size or your detectable difference squared. <clears throat> All right, so if we're using an alpha of 0 0.05 and a beta of 4 times that, 0 0.2, you can look up on the Z tables, our Z beta is 0 0.842, and then our alpha, right, because it's Z alpha over 2, is the 1.645. And so the last piece is what is this effect size or what is that detectable difference? So let's go back to that miles per hour again. Uh, let's say I am looking for, and uh, I can tell you that normally uh, for speed studies, our standard deviation is somewhere around 7.5 on average. Um, so what sample size do we need if we want to look at, let's create a little table. I want to be able to determine a difference in one mile per hour. Right, so if I take my 0.842 minus my 1.645, and it's actually a negative 1.645, so you add them together, You square that, um, and then we multiply that by 7.5 squared divided by 1. We need a sample size of about 348 vehicles. Okay? All right. Well, let's jump up to 5 miles an hour. So now we divide it by 25. Now I only need a sample size of 14. So the larger the effect, the smaller the sample size, the smaller the effect, the larger the sample size. So that's just a good way to get you an idea of you know, how much of a sample size do you need. Um, I never collect more than 100 data points anyway. So um, there we have that. <clears throat> 